Hello, and welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I am your host, Bart Vanderzee, and I have the pleasure today to be joined by Rob Cook of Rebeats, and you may know him from the Chicago Drum Show. Rob, how are you? Good, good. Good to talk to you. Awesome. Well, thank you for being here. Um, our goal today is to go through the history of leady drums, um, and you have a book coming out this year. It is called The Leady Way. So, yeah, why don't we just go ahead and dig right in to the history of Leedy? So I'll let you take it away. Okay. Um, yeah, we might want to talk some other time about a man named George Way because he's pretty well tied into it. And uh, in fact, it's a good 40% probably of uh, the Leedy Way book, which is the reason for the title. But uh, And there's a lot of reasons why George was uh, an integral part of, uh, of Leedy, but that's why the book title, and uh, we'll talk another time about uh, George's background and so on, because there's plenty of uh, Leedy to uh, fill up uh, a podcast, hmm. I think. But um, one, of, one of the striking things about Leedy and uh, a, a parallel with Ludwig, and I've done so many of these books that uh, the parallels seem more and more to hit me in the face and the, the commonalities of these companies. But the thing with both Ludwig and Leedy is that they were started by percussionists who had a need for improved equipment and managed to do it and then kind of listen to voices and follow their dreams and, and end up uh, producing not only their original product, but a bunch of other things. So, with Ludwig, it was the pedal, the folding pedal, uh, the portable uh, bass drum pedal. Um, and we won't get, get into the significance of that because it's not about Ludwig right now. But but uh, by the same token, it with Leedy, it was the folding uh, snare drum stand. Uh, drummers often were just putting their uh, drums on a chair or wearing them, uh, marching drums, of course. Uh, and then putting that drum when they were in a stationary uh, setting uh, on a chair. So it, it seems uh, like an obvious thing that would have been invented with the drum way back when, but, but the folding drum stand was a, was a pretty big deal. And uh, one of the keys to Leedy's success. Now, he, he had been making drums before that, uh, his father was a cabinet maker, so he, he had been around woodworking skills, and his father, it, it said, even helped him with some of the early drums. But at that time, he was a performing percussionist. Uh, from a very young age, uh, a lady was a professional percussionist and uh, a well-known one, uh, a very well-trained, very competent uh, percussionist and that ultimately uh, led him into manufacturing. And we're talking about Ulysses G. Leedy, correct? Or U. G. Leedy? Correct. Correct. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. And uh, so he started uh, uh, working out of his apartment. He shared an apartment with a clarinet player that he uh, performed with often in uh, different settings around Indianapolis. And uh, their apartment was was full of stuff. Uh I was fortunate to have met and interviewed uh, early on, uh, early on for me in the course of these books, uh, all three of the four children of U.G. Leedy. And uh, one lived in Michigan, um, and he, he told me that uh, originally in that apartment that his father had shared with this clarinet player, uh, Sam Cooley, that it was just so cluttered there that Cooley became his partner kind of by default. He had no choice because their apartment was full of stuff and he was always climbing over it and so on. But uh, initially it was the Leedy and Cooley Manufacturing Company with the address of uh, the apartment that they were, they were sharing. And they uh, grew out of that. I mean, it, it it just got overwhelming with all the, uh, you know, the wood and woodwork going on and the, the metal work of putting these stands together and so on. So uh, uh, UG Leedy moved to a, a location in a cyclorama building, a uh, huge building that was, uh, I think it was within the first decade that it had been created. 
and it, a big round building that had uh, uh, murals all the way around, and that there was a their presentations would change. And as part of that building, there were a couple of floors of offices and shops and so on. And uh, they they took a, a location on the lower level of the Cyclorama building. And things are a little bit foggy about the exit of Sam Cooley, but uh, we do know that uh, about the time that uh, Eugene Leedy relocated from the apartment to the Cyclorama, uh, he incorporated, and that, that was in uh, 1903. Wow, that's unbelievable that he, he starts in an apartment and then goes to big, large-scale manufacturing. I mean, that's just like an inspirational story. Well, it, it didn't happen quite that fast. It, I mean, because they went from the apartment geared up to making the snare drums and uh, the, the folding drum stand, uh, and it, it wasn't an overnight thing to making everything that a percussionist could use. But things really started to happen uh, when he incorporated in 1903 and uh, moved to the Cyclorama. And this is uh, an area that I think is, is pretty much new information to most of the drum historians out there in the vintage drum community in, in general. And that's the, uh, it wasn't that U.G. Levy had a couple of employees who weren't very important, but on the first catalog he put out, it's got uh, on the title page that Levy Manufacturing, and it's got three names, U.G. Levy and uh, Herman Winterhoff and uh, Charles Wanamacher. Well, Wanamacher and Winterhoff weren't just run-of-the-mill employees. They were keys to the expansion over the next few years. And as it turns out, we've, we've discovered that uh, Wanamaker, uh, Charles Wanamaker, already had an office in the Cyclorama. And it's possible that he even met uh, Levy there, or it's possible that since they were both Masons, that they knew each other from the, you know, the lodge or something. But at any rate, Wanamaker was... Uh, let's see, I had to look it up, 20, 30 years older than U.G. Levy and already had experience with patents and uh, setting up corporations, uh, setting up machine shops, uh, a lot of the uh, manufacturing know-how that would be critical to Levy. Levy undoubtedly knew a lot of those things over the, the next 10, 20 years, but um, I really think that uh, the meeting Wanamaker and hooking up with him was a, a big key to the expansion and success of, of Levy. The other guy, uh, the third guy, uh, uh, Winterhoff, Herman Winterhoff, uh, had perfect pitch and was a, a mallet instrument specialist. And he ended up uh, really kind of... Uh, shepherding uh, Levy through the introduction of their uh, vibraphones, marimbas, uh, chimes, all the, the uh, tuned uh, percussion instruments. And he was a close personal friend of uh, UG Levy. They often uh, vacationed together and would stay up late at night discussing classical music, according to some of the stories of the, the Levy children that went along on these uh, a lake vacations to Clinger Lake in Michigan. Um, but uh, now those three were, were also um, not just uh, casual partners, but they were uh, legal business partners. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like they were just employees, like I've, I've seen written uh, occasionally. Yeah, it sounds like they weren't just, uh, like they were in each, all three of them integral parts with business mind more of the percussion side of things like mallets and stuff to come together to make basically all parts that were necessary for this yeah. company. Yeah. And, uh, they, they had a bit of capital to, to, uh, goose things along in the cyclorama, uh, that the, uh, uh, we don't have the uh, percent of ownership as of the articles of declaration of incorporation rather being filed in 1903, but we do have uh, a stockholder list and breakdown of 1906, shortly after that, 
And that shows uh, Winterhof at 24%, Wanamaker at 23%, and Leedy, UG Leedy at 34%. Mm-hmm. And really, UG Leedy never in the course of uh, his career and uh, uh, life actually owned much more than that of the Leedy Manufacturing Company. There were a number of other smaller stockholders. Uh, a couple of them were recognized as uh, uh, integral part of a Leedy once it got up and running. Roy Jeffries was an engineer, and Al Kirst was the, the money guy, the treasurer. Um, but they were they were also stockholders in the uh, original Leedy company. Um, it, we, we got a lot of documents from the uh, archives of um, the state of Indiana, uh, dormant corporation uh, filings and so on. And we uh, found that by 1929, uh, Winterhof was still a, a significant stockholder. U.G. Uh, Leedy was down to 28.5%. I'm, I'm referring to 20, 1929, just before they were bought out by Khan. Yeah. And actually, Khan by this time owned 49 and a half percent of the company. So we, we speculate that, um, he bought out Charles Wanamaker who would have been, you know, past retirement age by the end of the twenties. And that, uh, Khan little by little was buying more and more of the company well ahead of the, the, uh, famous, uh, acquisition of, uh, 1929. Yeah. Uh, um, and, and back to the, the, uh, uh actual manufacturing and so on they again were were making items that uh, the percussionists needed and as they expanded they became the only manufacturer that made virtually everything that they sold and distributed there were a few things like chinese toms and uh, symbols and so on that they uh, did not manufacture but they were the only company that had their own trunk department to make these, you know, what we would think of as cases, but they were actually like large touring luggage trunks and so on for all, all manner of instruments to be transported by train and wagon and so on. Wow. And now, who, who was their competition at this time? Just like to, to kind of get a, uh, an idea of the, the, the landscape there. Uh, Khan was uh, was big, and uh, there were there were Khan uh, drums and timpani and so on. Uh, Khan was bigger in the bulk of their their empire was in uh, band instruments and orchestral instruments of, of all kinds. Uh, and in fact, some of their products were even sourced from Levy, but in ways they were competitors and uh, none of it was happening in a vacuum. There was also the Wurlitzer company and Wurlitzer was, had a significant block of stock in uh, Khan. So uh, there was a lot of buying and selling uh, back and forth between manufacturers. But I would say Ludwig probably loomed as the, as the largest uh, and most significant competition. Yeah. Um, they also had their own tannery, as did Leedy, so they could process you know, raw skins through to finished uh, drum heads. Um, at one point or another, both Leedy and Ludwig were the, the world's largest drum companies of, of the 20s. Uh, things kind of shifted uh, back and forth, but... Those were the big ones. Uh, uh, Gretsch was in business, but they were, at this point in the 20s, more of a, uh, a distributor of all kinds of musical instruments. You, you look at a uh, Gretsch catalog from the 20s, and you'll find uh, accordions and pianos hmm. and That's interesting. everything you can think of. Uh, and they wouldn't you know, become a, a real competitive force in drum manufacturing for you know, another decade or two. Hmm. Um, Rod, Rogers kind of the same way. Rogers goes back to about the turn of the century, uh, and originally, uh, specializing in drum heads only and skins. And a lot of the other companies, uh, around it in that day, uh, drum, uh, companies that sold drums would, would get their skins from Rogers, or if they got multiple, 
levels of, of skins, the highest quality were always, you know, the, the Rogers. Uh, and they, they didn't get into manufacturing and become, a, you know, a, known as the Rogers drum company, et cetera, until much later. So through the 20s, the two biggies were really um, Leedy and Ludwig. And in your history, I know that uh, in the 20s, Leedy was, it looks like it, they were making like over $250,000 a year in 1920, um, which is obviously a, a huge amount of money for a, a, a drum company to be making. So they're they're doing pretty well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they peaked, uh, interestingly enough, in uh, 1927. And the reason I say interestingly enough is when I was doing this book, it seemed like time after time, significant changes or shifts in the, the landscape that uh, the musician was working in and that this manufacturer was producing in had seismic shifts in and around 1927. Uh, it, it got to the point where I, I started making separate notes every time this happened, and I, I had to include a page in the book that's just titled 1927 because mm-hmm. <laughs> there were there were so many quantum shifts. Um let me, let me just uh, scroll through them real fast. Sure. Uh, one is uh, radio cripples the piano industry. The invention of radio and its its domination uh, destroyed piano sales. Um, so uh, that really set the musical instrument manufacturing business at the ear, the invention of radio. And it really took a toll on uh, piano sales. Well, that didn't affect the drummer so much, but talking movies certainly did. Yes, uh, absolutely. The jazz singer released in 1927, and I, yeah, I know uh, Kelly talked about that uh, the other day, so we won't, we won't dwell on that. No, sure. But that was here, here we are back in 1927. Next, the, the banjo uh, plunged in popularity, and both Leedy and Ludwig, I should say Ludwig and Ludwig, because it at that time, it was the Ludwig and Ludwig Drum Company. Um, so both Leedy and Ludwig and Ludwig independently and as competitors geared up to produce the banjo and in a big way. They both made very expensive uh, banjos with uh, gold plating and engraving. They had, of course, cheaper ones too, but both companies had a whole line of banjos and it was not inexpensive to get into. And uh, 1927, it started to hit the fan with the demand for uh, banjos and the Leedy sales in 28 and 29 uh, just plummeted. 27 was the all-time high, and they had just remodeled the factory, expanded it. By now, actually, we've jumped ahead from, you know, a long way from 1906 in the Cyclorama to 1929. But in that interim, they they built a small building and expanded on it over and over again until it was a you know a city block square with multiple additions. And uh, in in the book, I have diagrams of each stage of construction with that are shaded so you can see what was added when. But anyhow, the the the, the last huge expansion was. 1927. <laughs> well, and then so, the, the Great Depression is like right around the corner, so that can't be uh, yeah. can't be good for business. Um, no, although they did seem to weather it fairly well. Um, by that time, they were a division of Con and um, and sales. Surprisingly, it's not like they they dropped down, uh, but uh, uh, so the the expansions peaked. The catalogs peaked. Uh, back to just a to touch on George Way for yeah, a moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, uh, 1927, it, to me as his biographer, seems like to be the point at which he spent the rest of his life trying to get back to, because he was pretty much in charge of of marketing, advertising, and a lot of things to do with production at uh, Levy by the the late 20s. Uh, he had developed uh, the, this marketing organ, their publication, the Levy Drum Topics. He edited that and put it together and uh, put out, you know, it was full of uh, new product introductions and local endorsing news and, and so on. 
So uh, after Levy was bought by Khan, and he was pretty much a, a, a much smaller cog in the the whole machinery of uh, uh, Levy production and distribution, he started coming up with proposals uh, for the start of a new drum company. And I have a whole file of proposals that he did in uh, what was it, 30, 36 and 38 and 41 and 55 and so on. Wow. And he, he always seemed to be striving to get back to 1927, but uh, the world changes, you know, it's a, it was, a, it was a pretty much a quantum shift. I mean, when we, in our lifetime, it's been, you know, the convention of the computer and everything going digital. But at that time, it was the shift from silent movies to uh, the radio. And uh, it, it, it changed lives uh, pretty dramatically. And there, there wasn't really a way to get back to the way it used to be anymore. <laughs> Well, and backing up just a hair to clarify, what when was uh, George Way brought into the fold with Leedy? Because I know um, he obviously worked with them a lot, and he's a he is Canadian, correct? He had his own. He had George Way drums in Canada, correct? How did that? You, I know it's a whole episode in itself, but how did he kind of briefly? How did he get brought into the uh, into the company? Well, he was kind of needed in that. Uh, uh, we'll jump all the way back to uh, when it was Winterhoff, Wanamaker, and uh, Yuji Leedy in the Cyclorama. And they, they're they broadening their line. They're making more and more products. They're, they're producing a bigger catalog. And they got some major contracts with the government that, that goes them along. And they didn't pay much attention to advertising because uh, they, they were making a good product and the the world was beating a path to their door to an extent. But they did realize that uh, Ludwig was a strong competitor and growing stronger, and uh, they were advertising. Uh, George was actually from Boston and became a uh, uh, touring musician. He, he traveled with minstrel shows in uh, vaudeville and so on, and settled after a few years of that in um Edmonton, Alberta. So his and his wife was a native Canadian, but George was actually from Boston. Mm. And and uh, on the side, uh, he was. I mean, he was the house drummer for the Pantages Theater and and so on, and, and played in the Edmonton uh, Symphony, and was pretty much making a, a home for himself there. And started on the side again with a couple of partners, uh, a company doing electroplating and making drums, and then. That kept expanding and expanding, and he was buying parts from uh, Leedy uh, to make his uh, his drums. And uh, the more he bought and the, the bigger he became, the more he caught the eye of uh, UG Leedy, although this was long before there were trade shows or you know, obviously websites or anything like that. Yeah. But uh, just from... Uh, when you're in that kind of business, like UG was, you're you're aware of somebody starting a drum company, even though it's on you know the next country to the north. But they they built up a a business relationship when uh, uh, George kind of out of the blue got the letter from uh, UG Leedy that's uh, printed in the book, a copy of it, uh, saying that they're looking at uh, getting into. Uh, they they feel they've gotten to a point where they need a a, a man for. Uh, advertising and so on and marketing and they want to talk to uh, uh george so he uh, went right down to talk about it and they came to an agreement and he was basically brought in to uh you know kind of guide it in that direction uh, but uh, he he did more than his share of uh, new product innovations coming up with the you know pearl drum covering and uh the uh um uh, floating head concept and uh, so on, but uh, so he was he was brought in in the uh, 1921, and uh, things things just took off like a rocket for the next uh, eight years. And like I say, 1927, then uh, not so much. <laughs> yeah, really. Well, that's okay. So that's a good 
Um, I'm sure there's a lot more, but that gives us a good picture of uh, of George Way. So I think we're back jumping up to, I believe you said, 1929 when Khan got in the picture, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, uh, Khan was, was already in the picture to a pretty big way, and the, uh, you know, the, the Levy children even did not uh, really uh, fill me in on as much as what I learned from the uh, corporate documents from the state of Indiana. And uh, they can't be blamed because uh, women and girls were not involved in the business uh, at all. And and children in general, even the, the male children, were often uh, dispatched uh, from the dining room when it was time for the adults to eat. Yeah. <laughs> so. Uh, they had, they had a, the Levy household had a parade of famous guests. They had, you know, everyone from John Philip Sousa to members of the Ludwig and Zildjian families and so on. And, uh, you know, Paul Whiteman and on and on and on, uh, coming for dinner at the Levy household. But usually the kids were ushered out, uh, so that the, the adults could, uh, dine and, and discuss the music business. But, um, the again, the the Levy kids they never even mentioned any involvement by Khan. They pretty much presented it as 1929. Their father was ill, and he was so ill that you know he needed to get out of the business, so he sold to Khan. Well, as I mentioned a little earlier, by 1929, Khan already owned 49.5 percent of of Levy, so it didn't take much for them to you know, be considered as having bought them out. At the time, it was announced as a merger. And um, at the same time, actually on the same day, they'd worked on this. These things don't happen overnight. So obviously, they're working on it probably at least six months. But on the very same day, uh, the papers were signed that merged uh, Leedy with the Khan Corporation and Ludwig & Ludwig with the Khan Corporation. So assurances were made by Khan uh, to UG Leedy and to the Ludwig family that everything would continue as it had been. But um, in other words, they would stay, they'd keep manufacturing in Chicago of Ludwig and Ludwig and keep manufacturing of Leedy in Indianapolis. And uh, this was a particular concern for uh, UG Leedy because he didn't want to uh, dispatch all of these employees and this big building he had built and everything and and have it all uh, crumble away just to be a division of a a faraway company. But they assured him that they would be keeping manufacturing in Indianapolis, uh, which would mean pretty much the same staff and so on. But uh, that didn't happen. Within a year or so, uh, they announced that uh, all Leedy manufacturing was being moved to uh, Elkhart, and the same with Ludwig and Ludwig. Uh, now Ludwig and Ludwig retained its sales offices in and advertising and so on in Chicago, and you, the casual observer would never even have known that all of these moves were being made. Uh, because the Ludwig drums continued to say, have a Chicago address because that's where the advertising was. But actually Mr. Ludwig had personally moved he, himself and his family to Elkhart and were working there under the same roof with George way. Because when, when the company was uh, merged, uh, UG uh, Leedy and the Leedy family, uh, were no longer involved. Uh, George Way pretty much became the Mr. Leedy because he made the move to Elkhart and was pretty much in charge of Leedy operations, uh, especially as it related to marketing and advertising and new product development and so on. But um, So it, it led to a certain amount of tension because now the Khan Company was in the position of selling Leedy drums and Ludwig and Ludwig drums. So they were allocating space and budget and marketing uh, allowances, all of these things for two different drum companies. Yeah. And they're both, they're both major competitors under the same roof. So that has to have some, a little bit of tension. 
Yeah, I would think. Uh, they, uh, I had heard it uh, reported or seen it reported once that there were disagreements, specific disagreements between Way and Ludwig that caused Ludwig to throw in the towel and quit. But I've, I've never uh, been able to document anything like that. Hmm. What, wow. what is well documented is that both men really chafed at being uh, a, a corporate stepchild. And this, this is one of the patterns that is repeated, not only repeatedly just with these two companies, but uh, with Slingerland and uh, Gretsch and Rogers, all of them at one time or another became a division of a corporation that didn't really understand the drum business uh, or maybe in some cases even the music business. And uh, it, it makes it hard for, uh, especially for guys like Ludwig and Way, who had pretty much been able to make a decision and carry it out the next day by telling people what to do. But now they had to apply to corporate higher ups and, and justify and rationalize what they wanted to do and what it was going to cost and so on. And it, it was just so frustrating for, for Ludwig that, he he finally uh, gave up. He quit and uh, moved back to moved he and his family back to Chicago, and yeah, and then a couple of years later, of course, started WFL. But um, yeah, that that that's a theme that I like. I say I've seen repeated over and over again, where a corporation buys a drum company as an investment, and the drum company just doesn't continue to thrive and evolve like it did up until that point. Yeah. Now you're, cause you, then you become an employee and obviously for WFL one in 1937, when WFL was founded, it's, mm-hmm. I mean, that's, I guess that's his way out is saying, all right, I'm done with this. I'm doing my back to my own, mm-hmm. uh, back to my own thing. Yeah. Yeah. So way continued though, through the thirties, right. Working for con he's, and he was basically the, the original guy, from the leady, you know, the old school leady, and he stayed. Yeah, yeah, and a few other uh, key people stayed too. John Yuka, who was doing the drum heads, and uh, I better not throw out names and without look consulting my book, but there were there were three or four other really key department heads that moved. Um, so it wasn't like he was out there on, on an island. Leroy Jeffries, uh, amazingly was on that 1906 uh, article, uh, corporate report as a stockholder, and he stayed with the company all the way up until, geez, 1950 or something like that. Um, now, uh, things slowed down. Uh, you know, they, they had a pretty good 30s, uh, but uh, the end of the 30s, of course, comes World War II, and, and everything slows to a stop. And... Uh, and George stayed with Leedy and, uh, in my mind, was kind of Mr. Leedy and, until Leedy really kind of uh, uh, slid off the rails when when the war started. I mean, they, they had a, a series of wartime drums that were made mostly of wood. Uh, but uh, finally, uh, George uh, left altogether. He just, uh, there was nothing much for him to do there. <laughs> so, yeah. So he, he worked uh, briefly for uh, uh, Slingerland and just started a drum shop in Hollywood and eventually came back to Khan in a, in a similar but downsized role uh, in the uh, late 40s. Post-World War II, that is when Ludwig and Ludwig and Leedy join forces, or they get, they get put together to be one company, basically. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Uh, they they combined the divisions and decided to call on Leedy and Ludwig. And uh, amazingly, Leroy Jeffries was still there uh, doing engineering work. He's getting quite elderly by this time, I think. Uh, but um, George Way was was back in the picture, and and I think it was 1951 they introduced the Leedy and Ludwig, and uh, their their feature product, or the uh, the crown jewel of the new Leedy and Ludwig line, unfortunately, was the Nap Tension drum. And uh, George had uh, 
come up with the idea and had some early versions of it in, in prototype and drawing form, but the actual blueprints and drawings were drawn up by uh, uh, Leroy Jeffries. And um, I believe that uh, it, it wasn't quite what George envisioned. Uh, clearly, it didn't work. The, 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 you turn the knob and the, uh, the basket inside the drum pushes up against the drum head to raise the tension or in, raise the pitch. Um, but the innards were made of aluminum and tended to bend if you mm. really reefed on it. And you did have to kind of really reef on it. I, again, we're, this, these were calfskin heads. Uh, so uh, the knob tension was, uh, they were heavy. They didn't work very well. They spent a lot of money in developing them. So uh, in retrospect, it wasn't the smoothest introduction to a, your brand new drum duty. Yeah. <laughs> but but and and George sometimes gets a bad rap for that. I, I've seen it pretty much written that uh, George Way uh, introduced this drum that killed Leedy or something. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, but uh, after cutting a little bit of slack there. No, it seems like kind of similar to the banjo um, kind of debacle where it's happening. You're going full steam. You think it's going to be great, and then it just doesn't quite pan out. Yep, and. Uh, they they were definitely looking for ways they be in con looking for ways to save money and be more more profitable and uh, it, it had come to the point where geez is what's the motivating factor for having uh, two different drum companies and and then we've still got the Ludwigs competing with us down the road they've just started up this WFL company so they they just uh, tried to uh, I, I don't know. I don't know if I, it's appropriate term to say cut their losses, but uh, increase the profits, but um, make use of the, that space a little bit differently than having two drum companies. We'll yeah. just have one drum company. But then they, they gave up on it altogether a uh, short uh, uh, four years later or so. By 1955, um, Kahn decided that um, it just wasn't worth keeping the, the sawdust factory around as uh the chief, uh, Bill Ludwig II, used to say that they referred to the drum division as the sawdust factory. That's <laughs> they funny. Had, uh, <laughs> they, the people over in the, the horn division had no respect at all for, for the drum makers. Uh, so they they uh, sold it off altogether. They uh, Actually, George stayed in the same uh, building and started uh, his own company on the heels of that, but... Uh, uh, George Way drums, and that would eventually morph into uh, Campco and Drum Workshop. That's yeah. another long story. But uh, what happened was George stayed there with uh, presumably some of the stuff, but uh, the Slingerland or the Leedy name and and a bunch of assets went to Slingerland, and uh, the Ludwig uh, name uh, went to the Ludwig family. The Leedy name went along with um, the Leedy name went to Slingerland, along with some assets, and the Ludwig name and some assets went to the Ludwig family. Uh, Bill Ludwig talks about that uh, in his uh, as memoir, "The Making of a Drum Company," and both he and Bud Slingerland made uh, weekly trips. Uh, to Elkhart, and they'd spend a few days down there, two or three days, and then they'd take the train back. And uh, they were they were mortal enemies in in many ways, in, in many different uh, arenas. But at this particular time, they worked together and traveled together, and uh, spent a lot of time in Elkhart, just going through the assets piece by piece and de- deciding which piece of equipment which would go to Slingerland and what would go to uh, Ludwig and uh, Bill Ludwig uh, told me that uh, at the end of all of this things were pretty well wrapped up and uh, Bill asked Bud Slingerland he said you know now that we've gone through all this what was your motive I mean it's obvious that I wanted the Ludwig name back for my family but why did Slingerland want Leedy and Bud looked him in the eye and said, well, the way I look at it right now, uh, most every town has a 
uh, Slingerland dealer at the top of the heap, and the secondary dealers carry Ludwig. But now we're going to have Slingerland in the number one dealers, and the number two dealers will carry Leedy, and you can have the third rate. <laughs> Wow. They're great dealers. <laughs> yeah. So whether he was just insulting him or uh, what, I don't know, but it, it kind of typified uh, uh, Bill's uh, opinion of Bud. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a lot of no no uh, love loss there. Yeah. So uh, the Leedy story, uh, should we continue the Leedy story through the Slingerland days? Or? Yeah. I mean, I think um, I think just taking it through um, basically what happened after that, because I know it's in, in that kind of era with Slingerland getting tossed around to different companies and being bought and sold with just basically mm-hmm. the name. Um, yeah, I say just onward. Let's take it to the end, basically. Yeah. yeah. So... Uh, uh, so Bud Slingerland end, ends up with the uh, Leedy end of things, the Leedy name and whatever assets uh, that he and Bill agreed upon that they would take. And I, I have no idea what those were. But uh, at any rate, uh, Slingerland did publish uh, a couple of Leedy catalogs, and they had uh, some uh, endorsers of, of note. Uh, Shelly Mann, I think, was on the cover, and there were some Shelly Mann models, some Barrett Deans models, and so on. But uh, I think there were only two catalogs, and I I don't think it was any more than uh, five years. I'd have to check myself on that. It might be 10 or 15 years even that they were technically available. But they certainly didn't set the world on fire. And uh, I think in the end, Slingerland pretty much decided that uh, it didn't make sense to have two drum companies under one roof. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> a, a lesson they, they could have learned from history. But at any rate, uh, they they stopped marketing and selling uh, Leedy drums and stopped publishing the Leedy drum catalog, but it remained an intellectual property, and the, the rights to all of the Leedy patents and so on all remained part of that package and uh, under the ownership of Slingerland. And uh, we won't go through all the fortunes of Slingerland. That's uh, yeah. for another another time. But uh, it's important to remember that Leedy remained a part of Slingerland through it all, up until the point at which uh, uh, Fred Gretsch separated them. Uh, Fred Gretsch ended up uh, buying Slingerland uh, and... Uh, he never did. Uh, well, when he bought Slingerland, he got Leedy also and all of the intellectual properties. Uh, he concentrated on Slingerland and building it up, and uh, they they made some drums in the Gretsch uh, uh, factory in South Carolina, and they were distributed by HHS as the uh, Slingerland Light series, and. Uh, uh, under mainly under the direction of Buzz King, who was at HSS and, and the brains behind the whole Slingerland resurgence. But unfortunately, he was so successful and built it up to a thing of such value that Fred was able to sell it to uh, Henry Juskowitz of the Gibson Corporation. Yeah. And uh, there was it was kind of a shock to uh, Buzz. That it, it was like having the rug pulled out from under you. But uh, Fred... Uh, is a very smart businessman, uh, really knows what he's doing, and uh, he sold uh, Slingerland to Gibson, but not Leedy. So he still to this day owns uh, Leedy and uh, has discussed with various people the possibility of maybe licensing the name for a line of drums, or a few were even made. Uh, he, in conjunction with uh, Steve Maxwell, uh, there were some drums that were made by Sam Backo of uh, uh, Nashville. He's a, a drum maker and restorer, vintage expert, and I think he's the principal with the Nashville Symphony still. Yeah. Wow. But uh, uh, Sam's a very knowledgeable guy and uh, had worked on a lot of old Leedy drums. So he made a few drums uh, with uh, Leedy USA badge uh, for distribution, I think, through Steve Maxwell in conjunction with uh, uh, Fred as the owner of, of Levy. Uh, but I 
don't think it's gone much further than that. I, I think they made a couple of custom kits for Trey Cool, uh, and it looked like they were kind of on the edge of breaking through into something bigger, but um, uh, I haven't seen anything really develop any further than that. I think uh, Gretsch production facilities are, are pretty busy making the American-made Gretsch stuff, and I haven't heard uh, any plans by of I haven't heard of any plans by Fred to do anything more with uh, BD Drums himself. Although anybody listening that wants to start a drum company, I'm sure Fred would would work out a deal with you for licensing yeah. and <laughs> yeah, or take over Slingerland. I'm sure Gibson could use a little uh, little extra money, but I know they're holding on to that um, trademark as well. So it's kind of um, like a weird holding pattern for everything right now, but. Who knows if they would be, I mean, it's kind of a weird market right now where, you know, I, hopefully everyone knows about Leedy drums, but to come out and say Leedy's ha- Leedy has new drums, people, who knows if people would be excited for that? I mean, obviously vintage guys would, but who, you know, you can never tell how, how well they would do. Yeah. Yeah. Clearly the name has faded and that's, uh, a part of why, uh, this book took me so long to do is, uh, I, I kept uh, running into uh, other ideas that were more market driven or uh, i.e. profitable. Yeah. <laughs> you know, doing the, taking time out to do the Gretsch book and the Ludwig book and so on. But really, I started this this book, uh, the Leedy Way, or portions of it, especially the George Way biography, uh, uh, almost 30 years ago. So a lot of the early files of uh, correspondence and so on are our handwritten letters and, and dot matrix letters that I mm, lost to wow. people. It was, it was, there was no internet and no computer <laughs> yet to speak up. But, uh, so I kept shelving it and shelving it. Uh, and it was partly because I knew that, you know, even though it, it seems in many ways, like it's my life's work and it's the thing I'm proudest of and most, the most complete thing I think I've done to date. I, I am not uh, ignorant of the fact that, you know, its marketability is pretty limited because a lot of people just have never heard of Leedy. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, it, it is definitely a piece of history because even, I mean, everyone knows about Ludwig and then the more you look into Ludwig, you see the combination of the two companies and it kind of draws you in a little bit to learn more about it. So, but um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and it, I think it's important when anybody is considering the whole landscape, uh, like you, you obviously are, to to watch the trends it's it's kind of interesting that uh ludwig uh like i mentioned before ludwig and levy had both been the world's largest drum company in the 20s and then ludwig and slingerland managed to both become the world's largest drum company at one time or another in the 60s and then you see this same pattern uh you know we saw levy uh ludwig and ludwig and levy both merge with Khan and then the the how how well it worked out for a corporation to run a drum company. Well yeah. here we come again. <laughs> you know, when the Ludwig family sells to Selmer in nineteen eighty one, oh now we're a division of a corporation again, as is Slingerland. I think I'd have to look up the date when they uh sold to Cow Collier Crowell McMillan, the publishing company. And they became a division of a larger corporation that didn't understand the drum business or the music business. So now we've got some downward spirals. Uh, Ludwig, it could be argued, has survived that, and they're still uh, keeping their head above water. But there's still a division of a corporation that uh, not too many years ago was acquired by venture capitalists and that always makes me nervous. Uh, yeah, really. <laughs> yeah. So we'll see. They they've got some good people in place, and hopefully they'll listen to them. And uh, you know, Ludwig will may, remain strong in the marketplace. But uh, I, I see yellow flags. You know? <laughs> yeah, history just keeps on repeating itself, which is wild. But it's yeah. cool. To, it's cool to look yeah. at it after the fact and say, oh, this happened then, and then it happened again, and then again and again. And uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, it wouldn't be as fun to be working for the company as it's, you know being sold but Mm -hmm. um well wow we just went through the entire history of leady drums that was amazing (laughs) yeah there's a lot of more more little uh we went down the main street there's a lot of little alleys to poke around in and 
I, I probably should have spent a little bit more time speaking about actual products and product developments, but um, that's all there in the book, and uh, you, you'll probably pick up a lot more. Actually, some of these guys like Mark Cooper and Mike Corrado are more knowledgeable than I am by far about um, uh, the the dates of the different coverings and the variations of the coverings, and I, d- I depend on guys like that a lot for doing these kind of books. With Gretsch, it was John Sheridan and uh, Lee Ruff, and uh, there, there's a lot of good leady people out there, but definitely Mike Corrado and Mark Cooper uh, are, are a big help. Well, it's all about the community and, and everyone helping uh, everyone out, because I'm sure people are going to hear this and then be interested in future uh, future books of yours and stuff. So now is a perfect time to tell people where they can find your books. Yeah, all, all of the uh, the major books. I, I have a few uh, smaller things like catalog reproductions and stuff like that, but everything is available from Rebeats, uh, just rebeats.com, and then click on the Books tab, and there's uh, Buy It Now tabs, etc. But uh, not too many bookstores or music stores stock them. A few drum shops do, Drugans and uh, uh, Percussion Exchange in Chicago and so on, uh, Pro Drum in Hollywood, um, Steve Maxwell and, and so on. But uh, all of the, the the major books, the the Rogers book, the, uh, the Leedy Way, etc., are uh, distributed by Hell Leonard Corporation and and almost every music store and bookstore is set up to get publications from them. So people should be able to go into a corner bookstore and order, you know, anything from uh, Hal Leonard's uh, Rebeats catalog. Yeah. Um, but uh, what, whatever they're inclined to do, they can go to the, go to my website. I even list most of the books on eBay, so they might, they might catch a, a little bit of notice there if they they don't find the Rebeats site. Cool. Yeah. And, and to spell it, that's R E B E A T S dot com. Um, yep. Well, Rob, this was uh, incredibly informative, and, and you were the first person I thought of to interview um, for this entire show, but I kind of wanted to get my uh, get my bearings and get a couple under my belt before I, I talk to the, uh, some would say, the master. So, um, I can't thank you enough for uh, taking the time to talk with, with, all, with us today, me and the listeners, and... Um, and I hope to have you on soon to cover some other topics because I know you're a wealth of information on on pretty much all major drum companies. Well, thank you. Appreciate it. Um, and I'll try not to uh, go too far off the path and uh, try to stick with what I, I know to be fact rather than as traditional narratives that tend to get a little warped at times. But uh, keep up the great work. I've yeah, I've listened to all, all of the existing uh, podcasts and uh, definitely am. It, learned a few things and uh, um, really am enjoying them. But keep up the great work. Well, that's great. Awesome. Thanks, Rob. Uh We'll talk to you. If you like this podcast, find me on social media at Drum History and please share, rate, and leave a review. And let me know topics that you would like to learn about in the future. Until next time, keep on learning. This is a Gwyn Sound Podcast.